good day or good evening, however that applies. Welcome to the sixth episode of Creation Genesis and Origins. I'm Dick Fisher with my co-host Ken Miller. In the previous episode, we examined the biblical ancestors described in Genesis 5 and compared the Genesis record to the king lists recorded in Sumerian that were found in some of the earliest cities in southern Mesopotamia. And we found enough agreement to see that some historical basis does exist where we can begin to examine the Genesis text through the eyes of a historian. It's early history to be sure and fragmentary and certainly should not be confused with human history, but it can be viewed as a decent, even inspired version of early Semitic history. Genesis 2 through 11 tells the story of the biblical peoples, some of whom were ancestral to the Messiah, and the story, indeed the lineage, begins with Adam. The biblical story and the story of early civilization begins in the same place, southern Mesopotamia, present-day Iraq. Civilization means life in cities. It means large populations with great ceremonial buildings. It means writing. And all these things are found for the first time on Earth, here in this ferocious landscape of South Iraq, Old Sumer. Here was the first law, the first science, the first war. And now, what remains is a stark warning to our pride in the human achievement, for this is all that's left of the world's first cities. mention in Genesis 4 of farming, livestock, tents, stringed musical instruments, and artifacts made of copper and iron even before the flood, Adam has credibility as a real-life historical individual living no earlier than 10,000 years ago in the Neolithic or at the beginning of the Chalcolithic period. But there is no possibility he could have been the biological progenitor of the entire human race, since our species, Homo sapiens, is known from the fossil record to have been living 200,000 years ago. As evidenced by Genesis itself, and supported by literature from the ancient Near East, Adam's existence belongs to a time roughly between 5,000 to 4,000 BC in southern Mesopotamia near the confluence of the four rivers of Eden, Genesis 2, 11 to 14. Although many archaeologists, sumerologists, and biblical scholars have offered insights and opinions over the years, we will try to extract the parts that are pertinent and include evidence to back them up. This is a map of ancient Sumer, or Shinar in Hebrew, as you will see it identified in Genesis and the rest of the Old Testament. We pointed out in an earlier episode that the rivers shown on this map equate to the rivers described in Genesis 2, 10 to 14, and the Persian Gulf is shown as it would have appeared at that time. There has been a persistent confusion over the location of the Gihon River that has lasted for 2,000 years. The Cushites, or Kassites, descended originally from Noah's grandson, Cush, son of Ham, Genesis 10, 6. Originally, they settled in what is now western Iran, and the river is the Karke, joined by the Kashkan, that flows out of a province called Khuzistan to this day. The problem was that this was not a good place to settle long term. The early settlement was sandwiched between the aggressive Babylonians and the warlike Assyrians to the west, and the Elamites to the south, who eventually destroyed Sumer in 2000 BC. 
At some point, the Kushites realized they were not in a happy place, and at least some, or perhaps all, relocated to East Africa, south of Egypt, where they could live in peace. And the newly established tribe named their portion of the Nile River after the river of their homeland, the Gihon. When the historian Josephus, who lived in the first century, compiled the history of the Jews, he apparently was unaware of the early location and ventured that the Gihon was the Nile River, even though the Nile empties into the Mediterranean Sea and the Euphrates flows to the Persian Gulf. There's no way these rivers could come in contact anywhere. Nevertheless, the King James translators followed suit and instead of the tribal name Cush, they inserted Ethiopia in Genesis 2.13, further throwing Bible scholars off the track for another 400 years. Students of world history are taught that civilization began in the Fertile Crescent in the ancient Near East. Identifying the various cultures that have flourished there has been done with meticulous care made possible by years of compiling archaeological data. The earliest identifiable people belonged to the Neolithic Naturian culture, which was spread from Palestine to Syria and date to about 12,500 to 10,500 years ago, clearly a pre-Adamic date. The oldest city identified with Naturian culture was Jericho. Just for clarity, pottery remains discovered in ancient and long abandoned villages served to help establish the origins of ancient cultures their lifestyles, diets, and other relevant information. When a location is excavated, the pottery remains are examined, and if they are unique to that site, then the people who live there bear the same name. The name Natufian, for example, comes from Wadi An Natuf in Israel, located about halfway between Tel Aviv and Ramallah. When subsequent sites are excavated, that contain the same pottery style, then people who lived there are called by the same name as those who lived in the first site excavated. We have no idea what the Natufians might have called themselves. Natufians were sedentary, or at least semi-sedentary. Some evidence for the cultivation of cereals, such as rye, was found, although in general Natufians made use of wild cereals and they hunted animals such as gazelles. The Hasuna culture takes its name from the mound of Tel Hasuna in northwestern Iraq and dates from 6000 to 5250 BC. Numerous agricultural villages have been unearthed in Iran, Turkey, and Palestine contemporaneous with the Hasuna. Identified by their coarse pottery wares, these people were replaced gradually by the Samara culture dating about 5500 B.C. At Tel es Sawan in Iraq, alabaster female figurines were discovered along with ornaments of turquoise, carnelian, greenstone, and copper. The presence of widely disparate materials in one location indicates trading practices and that trading routes had been established by that time. Dating to 5500 to 4500 BC, the Halaf culture succeeded, but overlapped the Samaran. Halaf pottery was among the most sophisticated produced in prehistory. They achieved even firing temperatures of 900 degrees Fahrenheit, giving a porcelain-like finish to the ceramics found from the Mediterranean coast to Iran. The Halafian villages at Tel Esawan in Iraq initiated rudimentary irrigation raised crops, and domestic livestock. Located four miles from the ancient Sumerian city of Ur, where Abraham once lived, is a small mound of Al-Ubaid. Settlements in southern Mesopotamia, dating from possibly as early as 4800 to 3500 BC, are assigned collectively to the Ubaid culture. Although similar pottery remains in Turkey, extend the Ubaid people to as far back as 6200 BC. The origin of the Ubaidans is unknown, although pottery shards show a connection 
with northern settlements in Iran and Turkey. Halafians were flourishing in the north, and about the same time, Ubaidin farmers began to settle the southern delta of the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. The climatic conditions seemed unlikely for the Garden of Eden until the advancement of irrigation could bring water to the area. Irrigation technology began to be employed during the Ubaid period. By 3500 BC, the Ubaidans were living in townships from Mesopotamia to Syria to Turkey. Iraqi archaeologists excavated Tel Ababa in the 1970s and uncovered a water distribution system in which ceramic pipes channeled river water and water trapped in large wadis into the village. By the way, a wadi is a dry stream bed that fills with water only in the rainy season. About 4500 BC, the region was settled by people who are called Ubaidans. They settled most of the sites where the great cities of Sumer eventually were to grow, including Ur as Ubaidan pottery was found beneath Sumerian ware. The Ubaidans spread up the valley succeeding the Halafians and were the first people to dominate the whole Mesopotamia. The purpose for designating these ancient populations as Samaran, Halafian, or Ubaidan is primarily to place them in time and place context and need not necessarily imply ethnic differences. Pottery styles are the primary clues. Later, when written language is developed and pictures are drawn, we can infer racial and ethnic differences between the Akkadians and the Sumerians who occupied this region after the Ubaidans. Broken pieces of pottery show a subtle transition from Ubaid ware to Uruk ware as the Semitic Akkadians and Sumerians began to occupy what had been Ubaid settlements. This slow change is more indicative of friendly contact with neighboring cultures than it is of a foreign invasion and replacement by conquest, quite common later during the third millennium. The first city settled in southern Mesopotamia, according to the Sumerian king list, was Eridu. The statement from the opening of the Sumerian king list is in agreement with the findings of archaeologists who excavated these ancient cities and dated the beginning of Eridu at 4800 BC, earlier than any other city in the immediate area. Here is where a fortuitous natural change of landscape came to the aid of these early settlers. Although irrigation techniques were known at this location, the heavy lifting provided by nature had already been done. At some time in the distant past, perhaps millions of years prior due to an earthquake probably, the Euphrates River changed course. Although it now flows in a southerly direction initially and then turns southeast before it empties into the Gulf, previously it flowed a little further east from a point north of Sippar until it emptied into the Gulf slightly west of where it does now. The Euphrates River today crosses the old riverbed between Eridu and Erech, presently known as Abu Sharain and Warka. This provided a perfect natural channel through which some of the water from the Euphrates River could be diverted and used to provide fresh water in a more manageable manner. Canals could be dug as branches off the main canal to irrigate their fields, and archaeologists have found ample evidence this was common practice. Eridu was an ideal place to establish a village. Located on the bank of the Persian Gulf at that time, fishing boats plied this large body of water and furnished its citizens with an ample supply of fresh fish. Date palms grew there and fields were planted with barley and early forms of wheat. Although Bible scholars have scratched their heads for many years looking for Eden, the Babylonians centuries ago knew the garden was located near Eridu. In an earlier episode, it was pointed out that the Akkadian Sumerian word Eden describes a plain, prairie, or desert. And Genesis 2.10 begins, and a river went out of Eden to water the garden. The Garden of Eden 
was irrigated. We can only speculate what distance might have stood between the Garden of Eden, where Adam was cast out, and the settlement of Eridu, where, it appears, he arrived. The garden may have been located in the city itself, on the outskirts, or within some small distance. If the same canal system watered both the garden and Eridu, they must have been in close proximity. In 1940-41, to 41, the Iraqi government undertook the excavation of Eridu. The lead archaeologist Seton Lloyd stated, here at last was possible to trace a full and uninterrupted sequence of occupations back through the whole duration of the Al-Ubaid period to an earliest settlement with some features so distinctive that doubts arose as to whether the name Al-Ubaid could still be appropriately applied to it. Pottery found at the lowest of 19 levels of occupation just above virgin soil was so unique that the excavators simply called it Iridu Ware. It was described as an extremely fine quality monochrome painted ware, often with a buff or cream slip. Here are some examples of Iridu Ware. Also found at Iridu, nearly at the lowest level, was another distinctive pottery style. In 1937, a German expedition discovered this very distinctive ware at a small mound at the village of Kalat Haji Muhammad. They also uncovered this same material along the banks of the Euphrates, located fairly near to the biblical Erech, and dubbed it Haji Muhammad ware. During excavations at Iridu, stratified prehistoric material came from two soundings one in a hut area, and the other was in an area where temples had been built one atop the other over a period of hundreds of years. Starting at the lowest level, just above virgin soil and working upward, Iridu ware, craft by the hands of unknown potters, was found at level 19, the lowest level, and continued up to level 11. Even at the lowest level, though, we have an indication of possibly two distinct cultures living at Iridu at the same time. Pottery shards greenish in color, often associated with obeyed ceramics, were found in relatively high quantities. Here is an example of obeyed ware. Archaeologist John Oates concluded, this may indicate a further division within these levels. Haji Muhammad ware first appeared at level 17 and disappeared by level 7, and typical Ubaid pottery arrived by level 12. Iridu ware then was first in order of appearance, though mixed with an Ubaid type of pottery followed closely by Haji Muhammad ware. Iridu ware and Haji Muhammad ware continued together through four levels of occupation before typical Ubaidan pottery arrived. Later, red and gray Uruk ware signified the arrival of the Sumerians at Eridu. Monochrome Uruk ware replaced the painted Ubaidan pottery and continued all the way up to the surface. All the other wares were gone by level six. So what conclusions can we make? Clearly, the Sumerians were the last settlers to reside at Eridu, replacing the Ubaidans. The Ubaidans replaced at least two other people groups who were the first to settle there, and nobody knows who they were. A group of people of some description had to arrive there initially to devise a method to divert water from the Euphrates down the old river channel to provide a sufficient amount of water for the villagers to drink and to be able to water their flocks and fields. They built reed huts and began a small community. Then a fellow arrives with a wife in tow. Perhaps he was known to them and perhaps not. They were a couple who had sinned before their God, were cast out of their lovely garden and now needed a place of refuge, a place to call home. 
though they had been naked in the garden, here they would need clothes. Perhaps they needed to learn the local language. It would be here at Iridu they would join this small group of early settlers and raise their family. Initially they had two boys, one they called Cain, the other was called Abel. Cain took to the fields while Abel tended his flocks. As best we can tell, Adam was well received at Iridu, and although his status had changed dramatically, he continued to bear allegiance to his Creator and offerings were made. Whether an Adamite population was responsible for Iridu ware or Haji Muhammad ware cannot be readily determined. We can infer that two or more distinct populations were living in Iridu early on. Whoever was responsible for Iridu ware, Haji Muhammad ware, Adamite or otherwise, they were supplanted by Ubaid culture as only Ubaid pottery could be found at higher levels until the Sumerians arrived and the potteries changed once again. We know that the Akkadian population sprang from this area at or near to this time. Whether Adam's generations were included among the Akkadians or whether they were the Akkadians exclusively can't be discerned. Some intermarriages or gene flow between populations seems likely. A wife or two may have come from a non-Adamic population and became part of Adam's extended clan. It's impossible to tell. Seaton Lloyd, who had been technical advisor for the Iridu expedition, published an article in a 1948 edition of the Illustrated London News. In the newspaper article, Lloyd described the Ubaidans as hitherto considered the earliest settlers in South Iraq, hitherto the discoveries found at Iridu, that is. Lloyd described the temples found there, such as Temple 11, that from earlier designs retained familiar features, such as buttressed walls, a central sanctuary, and lateral chambers. Until the excavations at Iridu in the 1940s, archaeologists had considered the Ubaidans first to settle southern Mesopotamia, followed in sequence by the Akkadians, who settled the area up the Euphrates River. Then, according to conventional wisdom, the Sumerians arrived who located primarily from Ur to areas north along the Tigris. The discovery at Eridu, according to Lloyd, changed the equation, setting up a new world order. I'm quoting here from the Illustrated London News. In the settlement area, we almost immediately had the good fortune to encounter a cemetery of the Al Ubaid period, exactly corresponding in date to Temple 6. It contained, at a rough estimate, over 1,000 graves of which during the weeks which followed, we excavated about 200. Early in the fourth millennium BC, these prehistoric men and women had been laid at full length in rectangular tombs, constructed of sun-dried bricks. Buried with them were standard groups of painted pottery, so well preserved that in the course of the season, we were able to recover no fewer than 200 broken but complete vessels. Sometimes the tombs, which were simply filled with earth and sealed with mud brick, had been reopened so that the husbands or wives of the original occupants could be laid beside them. Occasionally the body of a child was added, though more often children were provided with smaller tombs of their own and miniature pottery. One woman, had been buried in a skirt with an ornamental belt and a six-inch fringe of black and white beads. Laid beside another was a perfectly preserved terracotta figurine, the male equivalent of the famous lizard goddesses found at Ur. A man, possibly a fisherman, had a clay model boat with a socket for the mast, perhaps the earliest representation of a sailing vessel yet found. At level 14, a smaller temple reappeared in the center of our sounding, and at level 16, there was a perfect little miniature shrine, about four meters square, already incorporating all the principal features of the later temples, 
such as an altar in a niche recess with a door facing it and a central offering table showing traces of burnt offerings. This is a picture published in the Illustrated London News in 1946. Underneath the picture it said, the simple shrine which constituted Iridu's oldest temple, 5th millennium BC. It shows the typical features of an altar in a recess, lateral niches, central offering table, and door facing the altar. Further, the altar showed traces of burnt offerings. Strangely, no one at that time or since seemed to realize what exactly they had found. What people group would build an altar and present burnt offerings? Today, if you would visit Abu Sharain, the modern village that is situated there, you can visit the mosque that was built nearby, commemorating its famous forefather, and say a prayer for him if you like, as the occasional visitor still does. As for the temple, this picture is all that remains that can be seen. The relentless desert sands have reclaimed their relics. Thank you for watching and thank you to my co-host Ken Miller. We hope that through these presentations you'll have a better appreciation for the inspired Genesis text and will share this information with family and friends with confidence that Genesis history can be reinforced with evidence to support its validity. And if you have any questions, please email me and we will try to answer them in future episodes.